Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll first react to the two last presentations before I go to my country of specialization, which is Kenya. Um, I'm sorry, I have to focus more on that because that is um, where my research has also been um, uh, based. So um, I'd like to ask both um, uh, William and Eric about um, maybe the question that comes up in their presentations is the, what sustains these um, um, groups or Islamist groups um, in both countries in terms of um, the network and also in terms of um, um, funding. Um, as far as I um, anecdotal evidence um, has um, is that there is um, some of fraternity of Swahili speaking um, uh, groups in the region. So I could have uh, benefited more to hear about this connection between these um, um, Swahili groups, which actually uh, um, supports camouflaging and moving between across the borders. Um, and also, um, there's this argument that um, groups like this uh, do not just exist and, uh, and move, they need uh, money, they need resources. So um, what sustains them? Who are involved in funding these groups across the region? And of course, uh, with the latest case um, of Mozambique that I know emerged um, not only 2017, but uh, much earlier. Um, and then um, the other question that goes to Eric is about um, your report. I have read your report, uh, your recent published um, report. And um, I'm wondering, because I didn't hear you talking about the, um, um, the mining. And a recent, another recent report that you quote um, is talking about displacements, um, repression by the government of Mozambique in this uh, very uh, rich, mineral rich um, uh, region of, um, of Delgado and um, surrounding areas and uh, displacement of communities who are using these places as their, as their cultural, um, for their cultural activities, uh, for their livelihood. And um, this report um, talks about um, the displacement of these communities and um, therefore um, their sort of um, vulnerability into um, this Islamist group or mobilization into these groups. So yeah, I could have benefited more from, from that. Um, um, okay, now I'll move to the context of Kenya, um, which I enjoy talking about because I've spent a lot of uh, years to, doing research there. Um, um, yeah, I hope it doesn't turn out to be another presentation, <laughs> but I just want to add a new perspective uh, to this, which I, have, I, I missed in Gala's presentation. And, but first of all, I'd like to ask, uh, start with a question. Um, Gala, maybe you may uh, respond by trying to link, um, you mentioned about uh, Mazrui, Alamin Mazrui, um, the connection between Alamin, Maz Sheikh Alamin Mazrui and uh, Mohammed Qasim Mazrui. I would benefit a lot uh, from um, hearing um, um, the connection between those. Um, and then um, what I also sort of uh, would criticize in your presentation, I somehow it sounded as if um, you're um, um, lumping the two groups, for example, the, the community-based organizations and uh, uh, that came up after the, in the 1990s after the Islamic Party of Kenya was uh, rejected uh, registration. Somehow uh, you don't um, kind of uh, draw the linkage between the, 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 these two dynamics. And I wanted to add uh, by saying that um, um, the, in the 1990s, of course, as you rightly pointed out, um, the, the, uh, the failure to register IPK, of course, we know what happened. The repression that time, not only in um, um, uh, mostly dominated areas, but the country as a whole against the Moi regime, um, kind of uh, led to different dynamics. And um, the failure to register polit uh, the, the um, Islamic Party of Kenya kind of led to um, the emergence of these um, NGOs or let's say community-based organizations like uh, the Council of Imams and Preachers of Kenya, the Muhuri, all these guys like the Sheikh Khalifas, the, um, the um, Khalif, 
the leader of uh, Muhuri right now, and also Abu Drogo, they were all together in their activism that time. So the, I will talk a little bit about um, Abu Drogo because uh, I, I, I do not want to see him only in the uh, spectrum of political Islam, but also localized, give it context. Um, yeah, and therefore in your presentation somehow, uh, maybe this is why I come in, I miss the transition, the how, the, the, it sounded to me like you're talking about root causes and the process for me is missing how, which is the first question that you were supposed to address, the transition from uh, religious purism to Islamist politics. So very brief, briefly, I'll go through that. And, um, but first of all, a note, um, we have to look at this thing in terms of a larger section of Muslim communities. Um, not all Muslims in Kenya um, um, oblige to these um, ideas of uh, purism. This is a, it represents a section of uh, Muslims and also political Islam, it represents a section of uh, Muslims also. So, um, yeah, and then, um, the processual part is to look at uh, each of these preachers and their times. Um, the purism, um, we know that uh, it did not start much as uh, Sheikh Abdul, Ab Abdullah Riz Rimo of the 1990s is often quoted as the origin of uh, religious fundamentalism or revivalism or all these things. Um, that you mentioned. Of course, he talked about uh, apostasy. He rejected um, a lot of um, uh, mainstream Islamic practices, but these were already rejected uh, by a sheikh, for example, like Abdullah, um, Abdullah uh, um, Sali al-Farsi al already, who was the chief Qadi of Kenya in the 1960s and until the 1980s. He already talked about that. But during this period, we did not see violence. We did not experience violence. Actually, even during Aziz Rimo's time, there was no violence experience in the country. So um, the linkage between, there's of course a connection between them, um, Sheikh Al-Farsi, even if he was of the 1960s, 1970s, um, he was con he's connected to Ab Abdullah Riziz Rimo in the sense that both were Medina University graduates and they were mentored by the same Sheikh there in uh, Medina. So um, um, maybe um, Aziz Rimo spoke more um, because of his, uh, the context at that time. The context of Aziz Rimo was marked by repression. He had a conflict with, the former, uh, with, the, with President Moy that time and he landed also in prison. And after coming from prison, um, he spoke again, I mean, even before he went to prison, he spoke a lot about Moy's repression and um, of course, then there was a lot of uh, police action against um, someone who rejected the secular state. And, um, but then he, there was dialogue there. Um, there was action by the government and then there was action by, by Aziz Rimo. And Aziz Rimo acted in a context where he, um, we know the background of this, the Digo land. Uh, Digoland, um, like other African Muslims, they were deprived not only by the British, but also by Arabs who deprived them education opportunities and all this. So Abdullah Aziz Rimo saw himself as, a, as, as someone who is a leader in the community, having studied abroad and came back to teach his community about Islam. So he was trying to do that. And then um, uh, spoke against uh, um, prevention of Muslim girls from wearing hijab, educational marginalization, socioeconomic uh, marginalization, which I'm not trying to say is unique to Muslim areas. It's um, common to d different marginalized areas, but then different communities react differently also based on the resources at their disposal. So um, in this context, um, we see, we see uh, Abdul, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Rimo, um, landing in prison, and then when he, he comes back from prison, he um, um, re, uh, isolates himself with a few of his disciples. They form their own groups there, and he founds the uh, Ansar Din. So anyway, um, moving ahead, um, later we have this new figure, which is inspired by Al Qaeda, and this is where the violence begins. Um, we have the figure of, uh, I will say, Abu Drogo and Al-Qaeda, so to say. Abu Drogo et al. and Al-Qaeda network. So, um, 
And of course, this is also linked to Somalia. And I'm not trying to say that the Islamic Courts Union, all of it as a whole, was kind of an Islamist. Fine, it's all Islamist, but then there's this Isla specific one, the Isla Salafi Jadid. It was also connected to these. These are all ex-Afghanistan uh, veterans who came to the region, all linked to Al-Qaeda. Um, yeah, so they were more prone to violence and we see that. And let's not forget that Abu Drogo was not just an ideologue, so to say. He was involved in the political process of Kenya. Um, he participated as a counselor. He failed and he, he retreated to the mosque. So to me, I, from my research, I would say that Abu Drogo was himself recruited by the Al-Qaeda network. And uh, from 2002, like uh, Ngala rightly pointed out, uh, there was this um, the, the Kikambala bombing, and then he calls for recruitment, rejection of uh, the state, and then the addition there is uh, Rogo calls for violence. And um, I remember um, there's a quote by Abu Drogo that uh, the real Mujahideen are found in uh, Ukunda, which is seen as uh, the epicenter of uh, Al Shabaab recruitment. Um, there's that, that um, idea that ans the Ansari, the Ansari Dean members of Ukunda then somehow are the Al Shabaab members. So I'd like to explain this briefly be before I stop. Um, and this is um, the resource mobilization, or um, the, the, we have to link this to the method of mobilization by Al Shabaab. Amongst many other groups, for example, the unemployed, um, they de deprived, um, for example, victims of police brutality. Um, we have people who are just ambitious in terms of change, wanting to create change in the society, new converts, etc., etc. <clears throat> Sorry, all these groups um, somehow were, were recruited, and this is uh, based on. It is based on my data where I look at um, mobilization for Kenyans joining Al Shabaab, um, where I have different, uh, a very colorful picture of um, uh, people who joined Al Shabaab uh, with different motivations. So, um, in this case, um, and um, I have some quotes here, which are a bit long, maybe it can come back during the panel discussion uh, by some people who um, told me about the, uh, um, their, and their membership with the Ansar in, in, in Ukunda and how, how they were in, involved with Al-Shabaab, this linkage. Their quotes are very interesting in terms of um, showing that it was not necessarily their per se being, um, being um, uh, members of Ansar Adin, but because of the strategy. So my very last point is on social function of religion. I think I would urge that we look at um, the social function of religion, a relational ap approach um, that helps us to understand this transition from purism to uh, Islamist politics and to violence. And um, yeah, as we know, the religion, um, as Karl Marx said, is uh, re the religion is the opium des Volkes. Uh, religion is the, is the size of, of the oppressed, of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless, etc. So we have to look at it in this sense. And also uh, with Islamic religion, which is uh, quite prone to in different interpretation, we have to see religion always in connection to the social. So I'll stop there. I know I've uh, exhausted my time, but uh, I can add uh, later. Thank you.